Hi everyone, I'm Bill Vassilakis, the Senior Minister of Christian Family Centre Churches and the lead pastor of our mother church at Seaton. We're located at 185 Frederick Road, between Trimmer Parade and Grange Road by the railway line. And we've been operating in the western suburbs of Adelaide for 44 years. And uh, our desire is to add value to our community and to be a blessing to all people. We love Jesus Christ, we love people, and uh, we are on channel 44 because we want to be a help to you in your spiritual journey, particularly if it's your first time uh, tuning in. Uh, it's my prayer that uh, God will really speak to you through this service, the singing, the prayers, uh, the ministry of the word, and also a time where you can respond to Jesus Christ personally and receive grace and mercy and help in your time of need. Enjoy the service. God, and I trust that's the cry of our hearts as well. I remember as a, a younger person reading the Gospels, reading the book of Acts, and thinking, God, those same things that you're doing in the Bible, would you do some of that in my life? I want to see some of those things as well. How are we? Are we alive? Well, it is a pleasure uh, to be sharing the Word with you, and it is Sunday, week two message of the Daring Faith campaign. And uh, we're, it is day eight of our readings. Just if you haven't already, if you haven't already caught up to date, it's not a religious religiosity thing. But it's like if you've missed a few days, that's okay. Jump on. We're on day eight of our devotional series, and it is message two. I was speaking with a couple of people about the Daring Faith campaign this week, and just pleased to hear. You know, one person was saying. Sam, there's something that's like ignited in me. This is, I'm excited. God is doing something, through the, something in me through this Daring Faith campaign. Something with the, the, the messages, the readings that are all geared towards stepping out in faith. The, encouraging us that God can do more. And oh, man, I'm like, God, would you do something through my life as well? Well, my week two message, is, the title is Daring to give God your best. Daring to give God your best. Turn to the person next to you and say, give it your best shot. So today we're going to be having a look at uh, unpacking this topic of, of devotion and dedication, surrender and wholeheartedness towards God. And we're going to be unpacking the illustration, one of the, the most common, uh, popular illustration that the Apostle Paul gives for the Christian life, the Christian journey, the Christian walk. He gives the topic of uh, an athlete, the life of an athlete, the lifestyle of an athlete, as well as the, that picture of an athlete in the race. And uh, as we're talking about faith, I just think, you know, you can give different pictures of faith. You've got the one about putting your trust in God is like the, it's like laying back in, putting, putting your weight on a chair and like trusting that that chair is going to hold you, like giving our life to God and surrendering our life and accepting Him is like that. But then there's, then there's another analogy because most of us in the room, and this is probably where I'm going to aim it um, today, is that people who are already on the journey, you've sat down in the chair, so to speak, that you've, you've initially put your trust, you've believed in Him, you've received forgiveness. And now the faith, it's, it's not just about receiving Jesus for that initially and, and inviting Him into your life. Now the, that idea of faith is following Jesus. And that's where we're going to go today. And I want to invite up, I want to invite up someone. I was going to invite up Finn, but he's, he's walked out. So I'm, I might invite up Tanya. You come up. You come up. And she's going to kill me for this. She, 
you're on stage all the time, it's fine. So one of the great analogies and what we're talking about when we're talking about faith is for the Christian life is, is the idea that Jesus, like he does with, with the disciples, the calling of the disciples, he, he doesn't force them and no one can force you to be a disciple, but Jesus invites us, invites the disciples into a life of faith. And we see that Jesus comes to Peter. Peter's here, you know, tending to the nets, doing the fishing. And, and Jesus, is as if, you know, figuratively, he kind of holds out his hand and holds out the invitation. He says, come, follow me. And so this is, this is the, the illustration of faith and, and that following Jesus is essentially accepting that invitation to where Jesus is going. He's saying it's not a stagnant thing. There are places I'm, I'm going. There are things that I'm doing. There are places I want to lead you into, challenge you, um, take you on a path and a journey and an experience. And he says, follow me. And so the, the Christian life is about grabbing hold. You can hold my hand. This is like, this is the most romantic we've been for a while. And, <laughs> and, and so it is, it's not it's the idea of not resisting. It's not thinking, but in those moments you think, Jesus, where, where are we going? Where are we going? What are we going to do? Is this, is this the best way? So faith in Jesus is essentially grabbing hold and saying, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. But not only that, for the rest of us, it's, it's allowing and, and allowing Jesus to, to take us and to lead us. And, and it's trusting that although we can't see exactly where He's taking us, what we're doing, it's saying, hey, come and follow me. T- allow me to, to lead you, to guide you, to take you into places. Give it up for my wife. <laughs> and that's where we're going today and in this series is that God is wanting to take us to places. He's wanting to, to lead us, to guide us, and to, and to position us, not on our own, but Jesus is saying, would you follow me into these situations? Would you step into these things, step into where I already am, and there is something for you as if it's going to be better than where you've come from. Just like with, with Peter, you're going to be leaving some things behind in order to follow Jesus. Hey, you're a, you're a fisherman, you're going about cleaning fish, catching fish, mending nets, but I am going, when you say yes to me, when you follow my lead, I actually have something better for you. When you grab hold of me, when you say yes to me, when you step forward and live, uh, agree to a life of faith and dependence on Jesus, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And there's something better when we say yes to Jesus. Are you with me? So the illustration we're looking at today is that of an athlete, that he is calling us, that God calls us to follow him, to leave our old life behind and embrace a whole new lifestyle of living by faith. And the example we have today is that of an athlete. And, and you know, if you've ever been around an athlete, there is a different lifestyle that they live. There is a different dedication with how they use their time. Their schedule's different. Their diet is different. Their priorities are different. And so that's the picture that we're getting today. And, you know, we've got a professional athlete in our extended family. And and you can always tell, you know, here I am going for my second or third helping of dessert. And and you look over and they are just not doing that. (laughs) There is something different that is required to live a lifestyle and that God is calling us for, to, to live the optimal life that God is calling us. It, it requires dedication, focus, training, as well as sacrifice. All those things we see in that picture of an athlete. Let's open up 1 Corinthians 9, where it says, live the Christian life like an athlete. Let's read together from verse 24. Don't you realise that in a race, everybody runs, but only one gets the prize. So run to win. Everyone say, run to win. Run to win. win. This idea that there are people who are dabbling, there are people who are starting. It's almost like the parable of the sower or the soil, that that there are are different qualities that happen. There are are those running who won't finish the race. There are those, there is a difference 
um, in, in people who, um, who are on the Christian journey. Some are not going to make it. But he says, don't be like those people who start the race and don't finish the race. Don't be like those people who fall away or, or lack what is required to be able to love and live and receive Jesus, but run to win and run to get the prize. He goes on to say this, all athletes are disciplined in their training. Some of you are saying, Sam, don't you talk to me about discipline. This, I don't want to come to church and hear about that. Don't, don't you be putting, putting that, your finger on these aspects of undisciplined aspects of my life. Well, we're going to go there. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it not to win a prize that will fade away, but for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm not just, sorry. So I run with purpose in every step. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what I should. See, there is a difference between amateurs and professionals. There is a difference between dabblers and those who are serious about it. You know, you can see that on the golf course. Like, example was for me, I was one, once hitting the ball so badly that for a laugh, I teed off with my putter. There is someone who is not a professional right there. There is someone who's dabbling. The difference is someone who's taking it seriously is not going to do that. And, and I, I see the call is out there for us. Are we going to take the Christian life seriously in our life? Are we going to run to win? Are you running the Christian life to win? You know, um, one thing I love in the field and the realm of sports is to see people who get plucked from relative obscurity and get thrown onto the big stage. Um, it happens, you know, in the, in the Big Bash cricket, you see this, um, players coming from nowhere, particularly through COVID. And um, there's one particular football player, uh, favourite favorite player on my team, who, who had this opportunity. He was playing in a country league and he got scouted, got picked up, got headhunted essentially from playing, playing amateur footy and had a, had a full-time other job and they get plucked out of that and say, hey, will you come and train with this AFL side? And so here they end up, they end up training with the side, performing so well that they end up in the, in the best 22, um, getting Brownlow votes and killing it. And I say, I love that. I love someone who's getting plucked from obscurity. Don't you love stories like that? And, um, but you see what's required. There is something different that's required on an amateur level versus a professional level. You see, in that, in that player, in his role, he had a, he had a, a full-time job. He only trained sometimes. Um, and when he got called into the AFL, all of a sudden there's this training program that's required. There is a higher standard required. There's a higher level if you're going to be successful in that role. And so it is with us, and the challenge for us today is looking at, okay, we are called not just to a casual Christian life, but a committed Christian life, where as Paul was saying, now I, my goal is to please Him. My goal is no longer to just live for myself and live for what is comfortable. And, and we heard that midweek in the talk from Rick Warren, that God is more interested in our character than in our comfort. In our, he's more interested in our character than our comfort. And we see in, a, in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, as we have been chosen by grace. You know, we didn't earn our way into God's family and we didn't earn our way into the calling that we've received from Jesus. We have been, that has been gifted to us. We receive that freely by faith. But yet he has good works for us to do. And we see that we have a new identity. And that when, just like the footy player who, who came from the country league into the AFL, that there is a new identity. Now, now this is no longer something that's on the side of my life, something that I do when I get time, but when I'm trying to, there's other things that I prioritise. Now this is the main thing. This is the main thing in my life. This is a key part and the core part of my identity. And the first point for us this morning is that we need, we are called to pursue Jesus as our main goal. 
not as our backup option, not if we've got time or if we feel like it or if all the stars align and they never do, by the way. <laughs> I've found that in my life. They never do. But we are called to pursue Jesus as our main goal. All right, prove it from Scripture, Sam. Okay, I will. Matthew, Matthew 6, 33 says this. Seek first the kingdom of God or seek the kingdom above all else. Everyone say all else. Seek first, not seek second, not seek third, not if you've got time, but seek first the kingdom of God and live righteously and he will give you everything else you need. But you need to pursue him with all you've got. Matthew 22 says this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. All your heart, Pastor Rick Warren would say, circle that, circle that, <laughs> circle all. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. One of the scriptures that has grabbed me as a Christian lately and been reminded of it is that in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, I'm not sure if it's on the screen, but it says this, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to him. That he has, of course, laid down his life for us. He has extended the invitation of, hey, will you follow me? And I've got a, a new life, just like Peter. Come and follow me. I want to make you fishers of men. I want you to give, give up what you have and devote your life. We need to pursue Jesus as our main goal. My question for us this morning is the challenge is, is God the main thing in your life? Are you putting him first? I feel like that one of the main reasons why we struggle perhaps with discontentment, with dissatisfaction, and why we sometimes have this kind of angst in our life is my life, there's something not quite right about my life. You know that feeling? That feeling of, of things not quite being aligned or things not quite being what it should be. I, I, my hypothesis is that things, are, we, I feel, we feel that way because we have things out of order in our life. And that God has actually designed us not to live partially for God, but to live fully for God. And that we fully surrender our life to Him and say yes to His leadership and yes to orientating His life around obeying His word and submitting to Him. That actually things, there begins to be a contentment and a satisfaction that rises up within us and we begin to get a sense of this is who I was made to be. It's like an AFL player, right, trying to, to keep their full-time job, yet playing at that standard there's something that's got to give that we can't do that and and I was reminded of this I had an opportunity the other day of um, I missed an opportunity and and I know that this is not you this is me I, you don't miss opportunities but I do and and there was a guy who a delivery guy who dropped off a package for me and he came in and and, and I said, hey, do you need help unloading those packages? It was pretty heavy. And, and he said, yeah, I've, I've actually, um, I'm on work cover at the moment. I'm, I'm on light duties because I've got, I've got significant back issues. And I felt, I'm like, oh. And in that moment, I'm like, oh, man, I, I should, I think there's an opportunity here to pray for this guy. And, and I, for whatever reason, I just smushed it. I didn't, I was, I made excuses. I, I was... I was in, in a meeting at the time. I like, jumped out of the meeting to go and see this guy. So I kind of smushed it away. And I'm like, you know what, it'll, it'll be awkward. And then, I, and I'm, I missed, <laughs> there's, not a, there's not a happy ending. This was just, it was just a missed opportunity. And, and as, he, as he left and as I reflected on it, I'm like, oh man. Not only did that man potentially not get healed because I didn't step out in faith. So he, he, he missed out on something. But even more personally, I missed out on the opportunity of having, have, being in a position where I could have prayed for somebody and God could have done something. And I'm like, man, some of, the, some of the boredom, some of the 
discontentment in my own life can be addressed when I actually step in to the kingdom living that God wants for me. That He is there, the Holy Spirit is prompting me. Jesus, like that analogy of grabbing hold, he, Jesus is wanting to take us places. And I believe that as we actually say yes to that and as we don't resist that, as we step into it, our souls actually become alive. I believe that that is how we design and that's going to be the antidote for a lot of the discontentment and the dissatisfaction. That the satisfaction is not going to be found in moving into our dream home. The satisfaction, greatest satisfaction in our life is not going to be found as we, as we end up with, with our dream romantic partner. Our satisfaction is not going to be found when our husband finally gets our, his act together and starts being the man that he should. You know, you can keep praying for me, Tanya. Our, satis our deepest contentment and satisfaction is not going to be found as we finally get into the role that we're, we're yearning for and the pay grade that we're hoping for. Our greatest satisfaction is not going to be found in those things, but for fully and wholeheartedly living for God and allowing Him to lead us. This is the type of athlete life. This is what we mean when we read about running the race running to win, keeping our eyes on the prize, living for eternity, having Jesus as the ultimate goal in our life. I don't know about you, but when I seek to um, prioritise God and when I seek to sometimes um, do the spiritual disciplines, there is a lot of opposition and resistance. I don't find those things easy. When I sit down to do those things, often there are a lot of excuses that come to mind. Is that just me? And I feel like sometimes there's all this gravity that's pulling me away from those things. Part of being God's athlete and, and living the life that he's called us to do is removing excuses and distractions. Hebrews 12 talks about, picks up on this analogy and it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great group of witnesses, let us throw off, let us remove everything that hinders, that, that idea of an encumbrance or a bulky, bulky things that weigh us down and stop us from getting to where we need to go. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and trips us up and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author of <clears throat> the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. We're called to remove excuses and distractions. Um, Tanya and I, I want to invite up Tanya to share briefly. And um, it was, it's been a real joy um, to have open up our home and have our life group. And we had our first group um, for the campaign on Thursday. Um, but I say it's a joy, Tanya, but it is also, as we've been talking about, there are also challenges... Um, to getting to the point of being able to commit to something like that. Um, share, why don't you share about how that wasn't exactly a challenge-free process for us? Um, well, the good thing about being married to Sam is that he will say, we should do this, and I'll say, oh, I don't know if we can, and then they'll announce home groups and you'll see your name up on the board, and you'll go, oh! So we're doing it. Um, and I must admit, we've done the 40-day campaign home groups for the last few years. And every year that we do it, I finish those 40 days and I think I'm so glad that we did that. That was so worthwhile. Um, but this year, we've got a new baby um, and we are officially outnumbered. And I thought, this is going to be horrendous. We're just going to have to take a break this year. I don't want to do it because... Um, putting three kids to bed and doing home group is going to be awful. So I expressed those things to Sam um, and clearly he listened and then we decided to do home group. Um, but I am actually really, really glad that we did it um, because obviously with the kids um, it was challenging. They, they were up till 10pm on Thursday night and... I'm sorry to their teachers the next day, but, um, and the house was a mess and, and it was a bit of an effort, but as soon as the group finished, I was just so thankful um, that I had said yes to doing it. Um, you know, we 
have had our group and I loved hearing from Pastor Rick Warren and I loved hearing him break down faith. But I think the, the best thing for me was gathering with a small group of people from this service and getting to know each other and talking about our weeks. Um, and the best part for me was there was a moment in our a small group where after we'd been talking about taking a step of faith, um, someone in our group actually took a step of faith and shared really vulnerably um, about a challenge that they're facing. And as they were sharing, there was this sense around the group that this was a Holy Spirit ordained moment. We all kind of were sitting there and listening as this person was sharing. We were like, yeah, God is in this. Like this person's sharing and, and the Holy Spirit's doing something. And what was so beautiful was unlike in a big meeting like this, when someone's sharing, you can respond, you can, sh- you can encourage. And um, this person shared and it was so wonderful to see multiple group members jump in with encouragements to go straight away. Um, People offering practical solutions to their problem. And we all felt um, to pray there and then for that person. And what was amazing was after they shared, we all felt full of faith. This person was still feeling unsure about their problem, but there was a bunch of us that were like, you know what, we feel like God has given us faith to believe believe for this problem for you, believe for a solution for you. So it was definitely worthwhile and I am so glad that um, Sam said yes, we said yes and I'm really looking forward to um, what God's going to do in and through our group over the next six weeks. Um, But if I can give you an encouragement, I'm someone who, you know, I've got the three kids juggling, juggling a few things at the moment and sometimes when you're looking for margin in your week, church or home group or things like that can be the first things to go because you think, how am I going to fit all of this in? Um, but can I encourage you, just like that scripture Sam shared, seek first the kingdom of God and he will provide for your needs. And I promise you, when God is your focus and when you're putting his community first and seeking him first, he will create that margin in your week. And I have felt that. I felt by putting God first, he's energised me in my walk. He's actually given me time in my week. He's, he's given me discipline to be able to do other things more efficiently. And I've definitely not felt like anything's been taken away from me by saying yes. But if anything, I feel like God has only given me blessings through saying yes um, to giving him this weekly time. So good. So good. <clears throat> it's worth it. It's worth it. Taking Jesus at his invite. Uh, his, uh, taking him up on his invitation is worth it. And this is what an athlete knows, right? And this is why an athlete runs and competes is because they know that the discomfort they face is nothing compared to the joy of not just competing but also winning. That any discomfort and pain they feel is worth pushing through. And I feel like that's, a, that's a, one of the first hurdles that we face is the pushing over and getting over and pushing through the I don't really feel like it hurdle. We've just got to get over that hurdle. As Christians, we've just got to get through that hurdle, don't we? And because we're never going to step into the life that God has for us and live the life of faith that we're talking about with Daring Faith Campaign if we're being led by our moods and our emotions. Um, I want to share a quote from John Ortberg as, as we talk about and think about that throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and what it means to remove distractions and excuses from our life. John Ortberg quoted this, For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith, it is that we will become so distracted, rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of our faith. Wow. Wow. And that's, that's so fitting because we can talk about this for our, in, in the people who are in the room today. You think, I'm not going to, I've made the decision. I'm not going to quit. I'm, I'm, Sam, you, you taught, you're preaching to the choir. I'm running the race or at least I'm hobbling through the race and I'm going slowly, but I'm still moving forward. And, but the, the challenge for us is that we won't just settle, but we'll run to win. We wouldn't just settle for a mediocre version of of following Jesus, but we would grab him, we'd take him by the hand again and allow him to lead us 
through those times of discomfort, through those places where we're feeling a little bit scared about where he's leading, but we're going to do it. And we're going to push past those distractions and the preoccupations that we face. We need to, there there might be some things that are in our lives that we need to actually remove, that we need to give up in order that we can take up the great things that God has for us. The invitation, you know, just as Peter left his nets, he had to leave his nets in order to say yes to what Jesus had for him. What are some things in your life that, things that you're in your time, in your schedule, in your commitments that could make way for something better that God has for you? Um, A few weeks ago, I was deeply inspired and challenged by hearing the origin story of David Pastor or Reverend David Wilkerson, the story of um, Nikki Cruz and the cross and the switchblade. Some of you might know that story of, or to give another example of what he did, he was the founder of Teen Challenge Recovery Ministries International, the most successful addiction recovery programs ever. Um, I was reading uh, some stats from that and just said that 80, they did a study of three of the major centres, the Teen Challenge Centres um, in the US. And after studying all the participants three years after, they found that they had an 80, 86% recovery rate for serious addictions. That is incredible. There is no other program that comes close to that in terms of its, its rate. And he, he was the founder of that. And his story was that God had called him to um, minister leave the country town and come into New York and to essentially bring the gospel to the most violent youth gang um, called the Mau Mau's. And, and essentially, he brought about a revival and a complete change and great harm to his life personally, put his life at risk, but led the gang leaders and, and many, many people to Christ and saw a transformation in the city. But we saw, when it comes to his origin story, I was reading it, he was, he was a... A, a really a nobody pastor in the country in a small church when, when and he was, had the practice of um, unwinding at a family and after the kids had gone to bed he'd unwind and watch two hours of TV every night until one night he had this pesky little thought that he said that God put in his mind he said what what could I do with those two hours that I spend watching TV every day? That's two, two hours a day, seven days a week, 14, 14 hours a week. That's good maths. Um, what could God do with those 14 hours if I wasn't watching TV? And he's like, okay, if that's, if that's you, God, then I don't want this just to be my thought because I kind of like watching TV. And... And so he threw out a, a fleece, you know, like, like the story in the Old Testament with Gideon. And, and he said, all right, God, if you're serious about me doing this, then I'm going to put an advert um, in the paper tomorrow. And if somebody, about selling my TV set, and if somebody responds to that ad in the first 30 minutes after the papers get released to the public, then, you know, that's pretty outrageous. Then, then that's going to be you, God. And he told his wife, and he said, you, you don't even want to stop. That's, that's such an outrageous thing. No one's going to call you within 30 minutes. But you don't even want to do that. You're being disobedient to the Lord. And they laughed at him. Lo and behold, the paper went out in the morning. At the 29-minute mark, the phone rings. Someone said, hey, is the TV for sale? He didn't even have a price on it. He said, can I, can I come and pick it up in 15 minutes? What do you want for it? I'll come and get it. And from that moment on, it was, it was clearly that, that God had spoken to him. And for that night, he got to his knees in prayer in two hours. And he started the process, redeeming the time that he had spent watching TV, entertaining himself. And, and I'm like, he could say, oh, well, look, I need that time. I need that time because I'm a pastor. It's, it's how I kind of detox and debrief and unwind and I need that. And God's saying, oh, I've, I've got something better. If you are to give that up, I have something better for you. And as he went in that, went to prayer every night, God did something to him, which led to the cross and the switchblade, which led to him moving to New York, which, meant, which led to the founding of Teen Challenge. What can God do through you? 
What could God do in you if you are to put some things aside to dedicate some things like an athlete and saying, God, I wanna say yes to the best things that you have for me. I don't wanna be a casual Christian. I wanna be, I want my whole life to be committed to you. Would you use me? Are there things in your life which are stopping you from being all who God has you to be? Hebrews, let us throw off everything. What are those things we need to throw off? What are those distractions we need to get rid of? And you know, the only problem with reading stories and being inspired like that is that God speaks to me about it. (laughs) And as I was about to turn on the TV late during the week, the Lord's just saying, Sam, you don't have to turn that on. Go and pray. But do you know what? It's the best thing. Because what I was saying is that Watching television and getting engrossed with entertainment doesn't bring my soul alive. Spending time in God's presence, doing His will, that is the thing that brings me great contentment. That is how I'm made. What about you? What about you? It doesn't have to be sin that holds us back. There could be all sorts of things, all sorts of good things that God wants to replace with something even greater. You know, it might, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, Um, All things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. What are the things that are perhaps permissible that you can do and that you have reason to do, but God's saying it's not necessarily the most beneficial for where I'm calling you? We need to remove distractions. My third and final point is that we need to find a way to train. Back to our 1 Corinthians 9 passage, it says in verse 25 that all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize, one that won't fade away, but do it for an eternal prize. All athletes are disciplined in their training. That God calls us to to redeem our time and to do things um, that are going to help us be all who He's created us to be. To experience Him and to live fully for Him. You know, I love now that the gyms are all 24-7, that there's no excuses, that like, before my art's too late to go to the gym. Now it's like, there's, <laughs> there's 24-7. <laughs> I can, some of us need to get in the 24-7 gym. We need to find a way to train. And even some of us in the room today, are over, over COVID and with isolation, you see different professional athletes they, they couldn't take part in their normal training and their normal um, exercise routine. But, so they find a way in their hotel room or in their home to do personal workouts and to keep fit. And I'm like, we've got to be like that. In the busyness of my life, in the busyness of having kids, in the busyness of having a full-time job and having study as well and having all those other commitments that we have, we need to find a way to train. Find a way to train. Um, one of the... One of these spiritual disciplines that helps us to grow closer to God and, and helps us to um, live more like Jesus is the, the spiritual discipline of solitude. And I think solitude in our culture is one of the most important spiritual disciplines that we can take up. Um, Henry Nouwen says this, without solitude, it's virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. That when we live in hurriedness, that when we're surrounded by noise and distraction, that it's impossible to hear from God, to connect with Him. We see this in Jesus' life as it reads in Luke chapter 5, but Jesus Himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray. That Jesus knew the importance of having solitude, having time with His heavenly Father, being reorientated, realigned, but having God speak to Him and pray and reflect on Scripture, how important this is for us. Another really important spiritual discipline is that of service, of serving others. And we see this again modelled by the life of Jesus, that Jesus in the busyness of His ministry schedule took up the towel, that He, he served, that He washed feet, that He met people's needs, things that didn't benefit Him but benefited others. Jesus orientated his life in a way that he practiced this spiritual discipline of service. I wonder, do we need to, what of these disciplines do we need to build into our own life? And maybe for you, it's starting that prayer, starting the day with a prayer of, Lord, who is it today that I can, that you're going to bring to me that I can serve? 
Who is it around me that I can serve, that, that doesn't benefit me, but I can serve? And in doing so, I'll meet you in that place because that's where you are already. And also, I'm becoming more like Jesus as we do it. Why don't we stand together as the, as the band come and join us, as we reflect on our own lives and our own hearts, as the call goes out and the title of my message, Daring to Give God my best. Am I giving my best to God? Am I giving my best to God? Am I pursuing God as my main goal? Am I removing distractions and removing excuses? And how can I find a way to train in the midst of the busyness of life? He has so much more for us when we say yes to Jesus. Why don't we just bow our heads and Close our eyes. You know, he, he calls us by his grace. We talked about Peter, that it wasn't because Peter was great that Jesus said, come follow me. It wasn't because Peter was awesome and that because he'd earned it, it was by grace. We were elected and saved by grace. But Jesus had a greater plan for him. And so too, Jesus has a greater plan for your life here this morning. A greater plan, not just to casually, haphazardly follow after Jesus, but to wholeheartedly give our life, surrender our life to Him and say, Jesus, my whole life is yours. Take my time, take my schedule, take my commitments. He's calling us to seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. Calling us back to a place of surrender. You know, devotion doesn't start with changed behavior. It starts with a changed heart, a surrendered heart. A surrendered heart which, which longs to live for God, which longs, which has been moved by Jesus who gave himself up for us who bled and died for us to give us new life. And he now says, come and follow after me, me be like me. Do you need to surrender your life afresh to him today? You need to reorient your life around him today. Let's, we're gonna to respond together this morning. And I just love the, the words from... Um, a beautiful song which expresses it this way that says my whole life is yours I give it all surrendered to your name forever I will pray have your way and that beautiful old hymn that says take my moments take my days take my hands take my feet take my schedule take my work take my family take my time that's the cry of our heart isn't it for those who know Jesus is to make that our declaration. And quite simply, we're going to respond together by singing a song today. And Jesus just, he's got that, his arm, he's holding out that hand to you and saying, would you follow me afresh? Would you let me lead you? I've got some, some daring faith things for you to do. You can respond in your seats, but also as we sing this song, I want to invite people who feel particularly that resonates with you and you're thinking, man, that is the cry of my heart. I want my, my deepest satisfaction. I know that that can only be found in fully and wholeheartedly living for Jesus and I haven't been doing that, but I want to do that today. Then we're going to open out the front, not for, not for prayer, but just for you to put legs on that faith of coming forward as a sign of surrender. And we're going to worship together and if... If you need to do that, if you want to do that, if that's going to be something that helps you respond to Jesus, then we encourage you, do that as we sing this song together. Thank you for joining us today. 
if you made a commitment of your life to Jesus and you personally received him, please make contact with us as we would love to help you understand more about who Jesus is and what he's done and the marvellous plans he has for your life. In fact, I would encourage you to read one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the beginning of the New Testament, and discover for yourself the wonder of, of his words and the incredible encouragement he was to so many people when he walked this earth and he can be and will be for you. If uh, you would like to make contact with any of our pastors or attend any of our services, you're, you're most welcome uh, at uh, our Seaton campus. Until we meet again next week, every blessing on you.